For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Every true, dedicated Christian disciple living in today's world has seen the negative changes impacting our societies. Moral decline is rapidly becoming moral collapse, and that moral collapse is fully supported, manufactured and encouraged by laws, academia and the overall status quo. Its aim is to break down dissolve and remove any and all traces of godly rule, influence and righteousness from today's world, where anything goes, as long as you shout loud enough for it. We spend literally billions of dollars on space exploration. Right now as you watch this, satellites are orbiting planets out there in the solar system with the primary goal of looking for definitive proof of evolution, quote unquote. To be able to say, see, we told you so, there is no God. But guess what? They keep coming up blank. They were not able to prove it here on Earth, so they took to the skies. And now that doesn't work either. But in the meantime, they still insist on teaching kids that evolution, quote unquote, is a settled, proven fact, when it most certainly is not. We have churches and so-called Christian institutions teaching people their agenda and opinion rather than just the pure word of God. And we can now be prosecuted find and lose our jobs if we misgender someone or refuse to bake a cake. Meanwhile, the faithful Christian sits back and sees all of this going on and wonders, is there any end to this onslaught of madness which gets worse with each passing month? Now I want you to see that again, but please take particular notice of the small print below the headline where the teacher talks about his Christian beliefs. It's blatantly clear to see that people's worldly desires and feelings outweigh the Christian faith in the eyes of the law. Of course, this is just one example. There are many others, not least the Christian bakers from Oregon, who were fined $135,000 for refusing to bake a cake. Of course, the plaintiffs could have simply gone to a different bakery, but no, this was a calculated attack to make an example of Christian values. The previous picture brought some truth with it. The sign said, it's not about the cake. Indeed it isn't. It's about forcing people to accept and to demonstrate that Christianity is no longer valid in modern society, which thinks it has moved on. But has it really?
aside from the LGBTQQIP2SAA community, yes, that's the latest title, we also have bodies such as the FFRF, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, whose favourite pastime is arranging lawsuits, quote unquote, to demand the removal of biblical or Christian themed monuments, etc., from public view. No surprise there. Of course they don't want to be reminded of the one true living God who sees and knows all things. So as we witness the Lord God being insulted, minimalized and marginalized, as we see the Great Commission being suppressed and obstructed, when does the breaking point come? When do we finally discover the one all-powerful solution the Lord has given us to put a stop to his enemies and remove the mountains they set before us? the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, the breath of God, misunderstood, misinterpreted, quenched, and in many cases, overlooked completely. It's time to really embrace the Holy Spirit, to get to know him intimately, and for all of God's people to call on him collectively. The battle we are facing as much as it appears to be in the physical, it is actually in the spirit. The Lord sent his spirit to be with us, and a big part of the reason he is here is to restrain the enemy. In other words, if we think it's bad now, imagine what it would be like if he wasn't here. To further highlight this point, let's go to a video clip. A few years ago, there was a very significant pastor's meeting in Boston, Massachusetts. It was not a meeting of Seventh-day Adventist pastors. These pastors were evangelical pastors, and they were coming from all over the United States, three, four hundred pastors. One of the pastors from Chicago was on an American Airlines flight, and he was sitting on the aisle. And as he was sitting on the aisle, there was nobody in the middle seat, and there was a man sitting at the window seat, and the plane took off. And this man, pastor, going to the pastor's meeting, sitting on the aisle, looked across and he saw the man at the window praying. And he thought to himself, great, I've got a Christian seatmate, but I don't want to intimidate him too much and tell him I'm a pastor. So I'm so thankful that I have somebody that's a Christian. So he looked over, the man prayed for a while and he prayed and he prayed. And the pastor looked over and he said, you know, I I'm just wondering, you, you're a, you must be a Christian. I saw you praying. And I'm a Christian too. And the man looked up with a very scowly looking face and he said, what are you talking about? I'm not a Christian. Are you so arrogant you only think Christians pray? And the pastor did not quite know what to say and sometimes, you know, you put your foot in your mouth, you kind of say the wrong thing. So the pastor looked at me and said, well, if you're not a Christian, who are you? What are you praying about? And the man said, I'm a Satanist. I'm a Satanist. And I've been praying. And I'll tell you what I'm praying about. You may not be aware of this, but there's a pastor's meeting in Boston. And the pastor said his heart began to beat. The hair on his head stood up, and the, the hair on his back of his neck stood up. And he said, there's a pastor's meeting in Boston. And I am meeting with a group of Satanists because we believe that Christianity is a relic of the Dark Ages. And when you look at the Crusades and all the brutal persecution, he said Christianity hasn't done anything good for the world, which is a total lie, of course. But he said, I am meeting with a group of Satanists, and we're going to pray that disunity will come into that pastor's meeting. We're going to pray that divorce will take place among those pastors. We're going to pray that their kids will be lost. And I'm meeting with three to 400 Satanists. If you are not praying for your pastor, the Satanists may be a praying against your pastor. If you're not praying for your city, the Satanists may be praying against it. I was going to Melbourne, Australia to hold an evangelistic meeting. I met with a group of Adventist pastors and I told them this story. 
at the end of my series on prayer, in which I urged Adventists to be praying and seeking God. At the end of that, the coordinator of my evangelistic meetings, an Adventist pastor, stood up and he said, I have to speak to all these pastors. He said, my wife was on a train the other day here in Melbourne, Australia. It was noon. She looked, saw somebody praying. And she said, oh, you must be a Christian. She said, the lady looked up and said, I'm not a Christian at all. At 12 o'clock every day in Melbourne, the Satanist covenant to meet together to pray that Satan will have victory in this city. My brother, my sister, do you know Jesus Christ? Are you on your knees praying every single day? Maybe you've turned into this broadcast and you're looking for something deeper in your own spiritual life. Maybe you have had a superficial Christian experience. Maybe you've been apathetic. God is speaking to you. He's calling you to set aside a time to pray. He's calling you to set aside a place to pray. He's calling you to pour your heart out to God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are spiritual. There is a battle, a battle between Christ and Satan, a battle between good and evil. We cannot win that battle without the divine power of the living God filling our lives. Will you commit your life right now to earnest intercession? Will you say, Jesus, I don't want the superficial. I don't want an external Christian experience. I want something deep. And each day I'll meet you at the time of prayer. Each day I'll meet you at the place of prayer. I don't think many of us knew just how serious the battle had become. But the time for apathy is long past. It's time to get serious. Time to forsake all other things which stand in the way of our relationship with God. Much like the 2015 movie, it's time to go into the war room, bend the knee and cry out to God in repentance and ask for his wisdom guidance and intervention for our towns, cities, countries and his children everywhere. Don't pray quietly. Don't pray gently. Pray passionately. Let heaven hear and feel your prayers. Cry out against the injustice and the oppression these God-haters are causing. Pray for them to be stopped, obstructed and blocked at every turn, that they may have no peace in their current hate-filled course. But in the middle of all of this, don't hate them. We don't operate at their level. These are people under the influence of the enemy, who have made consistently bad choices but they need to be taught to wake up from those bad choices. So let this be the focus of our fervent prayers. The enemy is a defeated foe. We just need to remind him by allowing his puppets to witness firsthand the power of the living God. Thank you for taking the time to watch this broadcast. If you are blessed and encouraged by it, then please consider supporting this work by clicking on the donate link in the comments section below the video. But most importantly, Go to your prayer room and abide in the presence of the Lord.